This is CBC Vancouver News. Without that snowpack, we're going to be dependent on periodic rain throughout the summer. BC hits a record low spring snowpack. The big worries as our wildfire season heats up. And we take you inside a police operation in Prince George amid concerns that a safe supply of drugs is being diverted. Plus, We've had people banging on school windows in British Columbia. New rules around schools. The province says it's meant to protect children in the face of anti-SOGI protests. The issue is around parental rights. Good evening, I'm Dan Burr. Thanks for joining us. BC has hit yet another worrying milestone. The province has recorded its lowest spring snowpack in more than half a century. And as Michelle Morton explains, that has sparked big fears about drought and wildfires. Across the board with areas in the upper Fraser, the Nechaco, the Bridge region, the Caribou Mountains, the North and South Thompson, the Upper Columbia, the West Kootenai, Okanagan, Peace, uh, the Skeena, Nass and Liard all having at least one station at record low just really shows how, how broad and widespread this, uh, this low snow year is. As of April 1st, the provincial snowpack is at 63% of normal. 25% lower than last year and the lowest since records began in 1970. Without that snowpack, we're going to be dependent on periodic rain throughout the summer to both saturate the ground and to keep our forests um, both vitalized and to keep snow or to keep the fire danger low, but also to maintain this flow in the, the streams and the rivers. The report finds only Vancouver Island saw a normal amount of precipitation. Daniels warns the El Nino winter kicked off in early spring, setting us up for a long, dry wildfire season. And we know that we're in a multi-year drought, so these are places already that had low precipitation last summer. We had big fires as a result last summer, and um, we went right through the fall with low rainfall, not enough snow through the winter. The report comes just as Metro Vancouver announces its seasonal watering restrictions. Starting May 1st, residents and businesses can only water lawns once a week. The River Forecast Centre says the snowpack could increase into May with more cold, wet weather, and it notes the low snowpack could have one benefit. The lower risk for flooding this year in the interior. Uh, areas that have been hard hit by flooding, I'm thinking about Cache Creek or Grand Forks, uh, they can, I hopefully will breathe a sigh of relief that the likelihood of flooding this year is pretty low. But he warns, sudden or extreme rain could still cause flooding. Michelle Morton, CBC News, Vancouver. The RCMP says it has called in BC's police watchdog after two people were found dead and another man was shot by police in a remote BC community. Mounties say it happened in Say K Dene, about 360 kilometers north of Prince George on Tuesday. Officers claim they went to a property after reports of gunfire and saw a man with a gun run into a second home. After negotiations broke down, police say they used a chemical irritant. The man came out and officers shot him with a less lethal weapon. You can read more on our website, cbc.ca slash bc. The issue of the diversion of safe supply has become a hot political topic in BC and across Canada. Last month, Prince George RCMP said they'd seized a serious amount of safe supply, but later clarified it didn't make up a lot of their drug seizures. But as Jason Proctor explains, new documents paint a picture of the trade of legitimate drugs for illicit supply in that city and shows just how those exchanges happened. We wanted to get an idea of well, what actually is going on here, particularly in Prince George. And so I've obtained a search warrant attached to one of the latest investigations that Prince George RCMP have been speaking about, in fact, just this week. And it, it talks about a 10-day surveillance operation that RCMP in Prince George set up on a suspect who was seen outside of a pharmacy every morning, basically, standing there trading illicit drugs, which she had to give people coming out of the pharmacy uh, in exchange for their prescription safe supply drugs. Now, 
According to this warrant, RCMP spoke to the pharmacy manager who said he's seen a lot of this since the uh, safe supply uh, program started up and that it's only gotten worse in the last year. He says he's been told that people could get as much as $20 a pill for the hydromorphone that they're uh, prescribed, which, you know, when you think about it, you're getting about 28 pills possibly a day. That is a lot of money uh, that is out there in regards to this. So as part of this surveillance operation, police set up a team outside the woman's house and they set up another team outside the pharmacy. And every day they watched as people lined up at the beginning of the day to get into the pharmacy, get their safe supply prescriptions and then come out and then one after another, they claim they watched them make these kind of hand to hand transactions off to this woman who again, was giving them illicit drugs in exchange, like fentanyl, heroin, that kind of thing, in exchange for their safe supply drugs. They claim to have watched a total of 77 hand-to-hand -hand transactions and another seven short duration transactions where they saw vehicles come up to her house. So this includes people with Manitoba plates, uh, Alberta plates, minivan, Mercedes, you name it, and make these sort of slightly longer duration trades, uh, what they say is basically drug trafficking, but involving safe supply drugs. Now, they've arrested uh, the woman, but she's been released. There's no charges at this point, and so uh, we are not naming her. But it all goes to the questions around the safe supply uh, program. And again, police have said, you know, this is not the bulk of what we're seeing in terms of drug trafficking. So we'll see where this goes in the future and whether charges will come. That's probably expected. Jason Proctor, CBC News, Vancouver. The BC government is moving to ban protests and disruptions outside schools. It's aimed at, it says it's aimed at addressing protests against the province's program around sexual orientation and gender identity. More now from Mira Baines. Legislation was introduced to create a bubble zone to prevent protests in front of schools or interfere with school activities, including extracurricular activities. It's aimed at addressing anti-SOGI protests. BC's Premier says parents shouldn't have to be concerned about protests at their children's school. It never crossed my mind uh, to be worried that a grown adult uh, would be waiting on the school perimeter uh, to yell at my child about pornographic books, about puberty blockers. Premier David Eby says scaring kids or disrupting school activities will soon be illegal. The Ministry of Education has documented 18 major disruptions at BC schools uh, since the start of the 2023-24 school years. Some parents have opposed the use of teaching resource SOGI, short for sexual orientation and gender identity. We've had people banging on school windows in British Columbia. Under the proposed law, people found impeding access, harassing or intimidating others within 20 metres of school grounds will be arrested or ticketed by police. BC Conservative leader John Rustad believes the SOGI guidelines should be scrapped. The issue is around parental rights, parents being involved uh, with their children's education. The issue is around um, information that's being provided within schools, which seems to be inappropriate in my opinion. The province says the legislation is based on the same framework used to prevent anti-vaccine protests outside hospitals. There is a sunset clause to the legislation. It will be repealed in July of 2026. Mira Baines, CBC News, Victoria. A house at First Nation has released some findings from phase one of a search for missing children forced to attend two residential schools in its territory. There were no figures offered regarding the number of potential unmarked graves at that gathering, but the project team did reveal more details about reported deaths. Between 1904 and 1940, 13 students died. 12 of them were sent home and they were sick and the records show that they were sent home and they died at home. The First Nation says field work and scanning during phase one noted likely and potential unmarked graves on both former residential school sites as well as the house at cemetery, adding that clusters of unknown features in these areas merit more research. They want the federal government and religious groups to provide ongoing resources and funding for those searches as well as mental health and cultural support for the Housed people.
So what happens next in a house at many other sites where ground radar work has taken place? It is complicated, to say the least. CBC Vancouver's Indigenous Affairs reporter Wamish Hamilton shares his perspective on why it's a very difficult and necessary conversation. Today, be a house on the west coast of Vancouver Island became the latest First Nation to publicly release the results of its ground penetrating radar survey. The survey work was done in an effort to find children who the Ahausa First Nations say went missing from two residential schools that operated there. It's important to point out that ground penetrating radar doesn't find human remains. Instead, it finds disturbances in the soil that are inconsistent with the surrounding area, places where experts say there is the possibility of human remains. A house that isn't the first Indigenous community to release ground penetrating radar results. The third anniversary of the GPR findings at Tekelmus Dishikwetmik is coming up in May. Since then, several other BC First Nations, including the Sashant, Shishal, Williams Lake First Nation, have also released their findings. But no First Nations in BC have excavated for human remains yet. This is a difficult next step that awaits all of us, deciding whether or not to take it. And then the forensic identification of what could be children's remains. Nobody likes to think about this, let alone talk about it. This is precisely why this conversation needs to happen and planning needs to start now. There are many cultural complexities to take into account. Communities have varied traditions about how they deal with death. And children who were taken to these schools came from First Nations around BC that had their own distinct protocols. The nations didn't invite these children to the schools and the kids weren't guests there either. So who gets to decide what tradition is followed? Then, what would be the repatriation plan? What about communities that don't have the land or the money to make this happen? Or even students with no bloodline left, no living family? These are complicated questions that have no easy answers. Only difficult choices that will take time to resolve. Speeding it up may complicate things. This is the first time our country has been through something like this. There's no playbook for this. There's no wise old man to guide us with his experience and wisdom. There's only us. Wamish Hamilton in Vancouver. This coverage can be upsetting and invite painful memories or feelings for many people. If you or someone you care about is looking for support, you can reach the National Residential School Crisis Line at 1-866-925-4419. It operates 24 hours a day and is available for survivors, intergenerational survivors, and their loved ones. Amazon workers at two distribution centers in Delta and New Westminster may soon be certified by the union Unifor. Organizers have been meeting and getting cards signed since October. Their application is now with the BC Labor Relations Board. A hearing has been set for next Tuesday. If the board finds that over 55% of workers have signed union cards, they will automatically be certified. The bottom line is Amazon workers understand that this is their moment and they're ready to seize it. If less than 55% of employees have signed the cards, workers will be given the chance to vote to certify. For its part, Amazon says in a statement, the fact is Amazon already offers what many unions are requesting, safe and inclusive workplaces, competitive pay, health benefits on day one, and opportunities for career growth. Muslims in BC and across the world mark the end of Ramadan today with Eid al-Fitr. A large gathering was held just next door at BC Place. The important thing for me is my kids. Like, I want them to see, like, uh, the celebration, because, like, it's a very small community here. So, uh, like, for them to see the happiness, the joy. Today is a day, a holy day, a day that we're supposed to celebrate with family and friends. Worship God, be thankful for all what we've got. Hanging out with family, 
and food, lots of food and coffee. Uh, today is all about like family and celebration. Uh, we celebrate the end of Ramadan uh, with family and friends, and uh, it's a day to be grateful for everything. It means a lot. Like it's a celebration after Ramadan and after like fasting for 30 days, so it's finally time to like eat again like during the day and enjoy being together. Darius Madavi tells us how wildfire behavior is becoming more intense at night when firefighters used to get a break. Stick around for that story. And thanks for joining our commercial free live stream tonight. It has been eight months since deadly, and pardon me, catastrophic fires tore through West Kelowna, destroying hundreds of homes. For West Kelowna Fire Chief Jason Brolin, there are important lessons to learn, especially in mitigation work to get rid of fuels in forested areas. CBC host Sarah Penton met up with Brolin in a regional park hit by the McDougal Creek fire last August. The district went to such effort to mitigate here to remove fuel and, and to prepare for an event like what happened um, because it, it means that this isn't a, you know, a moonscape of, of black toothpicks. Uh, the work that was done here means that this park will, will bounce back and it will be made safe for the public again in the coming years and, and they'll be able to come back in here and, and do that. What's your hope that more, more of our forest and land around us can be like this area? I mean, you pointed out areas that have not been mitigated. How are you feeling when you look around those areas that haven't had this kind of work done? Yeah, what happened to us here happened to us because of, largely because of the weather, because we didn't get rain, because, you know, we had extreme winds that passed through when the temperatures were extremely high. We can't control the weather. Um, you know, the weather is changing and, and we're going to have to adapt to it. But what we can do is, is you know, adapt the spaces that we use. Uh, we can, you know, fortify the spaces around our homes, for example, um, to give them a chance to survive fire uh, when it does come. Um, and to give, you know, firefighters the space to do their work uh, so that the fire isn't in the canopy of the trees when we get here. So it is on the ground when we have to fight it. Could the province be doing more to, to be mitigating our forests to make a difference? When you, you look at it uh, against the cost of fighting a wildfire like this, uh, it really, even just a small percentage of that, that cost could go a long way to, you know, reducing the intensity of a fire or, or preventing it coming into a neighborhood and, and destroying homes. And, and that's the argument that we'll continue to make is, is looking at, you know, what end of the problem should we be spending the money on? Should we be spending it on fighting it when the fire is happening? Or should we be spending it on preventing that fire from happening in the first place? And it's easy to say, uh, but it's difficult when in reality now we're at a point um, because of a change in climate that we have to spend it on both. And if ever there, like you said, if ever there was a time, it's now, it's, and there, sh there would be an appetite now because we're, we're just coming on the other end of the worst fire season we've ever had. And yet, do you think enough is being done right now? There's always more that can be done. Um, you know, every load of like cedar hedges that I see going to the landfill uh, or the yard waste, I'm happy about. But you don't have to look very far to see, you know, the same things being planted uh, in a new neighborhood, for example. So we've got a lot of work to do. As we head into another summer with extreme drought conditions, wildfire fighters are gearing up for what is likely another busy season. But it's not just about the number of fires, it's when they burn. And a new study finds that task could get a lot more demanding at night. Science and climate specialist Darius Madavi is back with more. Darius, why is this study so significant? I don't think it would be exaggerating to say that this paper really changes the way we think about fires. It shows that thanks to climate change and extreme drought, the active days, quiet nights model of fire activity is failing us. 
As more and more fires burn through the night, researchers were looking at the frequency of what we call overnight burning events, where a fire burns right through the night into the next day. Now, these are really challenging to fight, especially because they used to be so rare, so we often don't have the equipment needed. Uh, generally, at night, temperature goes down, relative humidity goes up, which makes the fire go quiet. It can still burn, but slowly and without posing many problems. But that's changing. Uh, from 2017 to 2020, researchers found over 350 fires across the U.S. and Canada that burned overnight, some of them through several nights, and most of them here on the West Coast. I spoke with wildfire expert Mike Flanagan, who explained the driving forces. It's drier and drier. There's more fuel available to burn, which leads to a higher intensity fire. So building up that energy that kind of allows it, it's like a freight train that's just... If it's going fast enough, it keeps on rolling even after you've stopped giving it the gas. Flanagan also told me that when they started this research, he expected warm overnight temperatures to play the biggest role. But they're finding that drought is actually the major factor is particularly bad news for those of us here on the drought-prone West Coast, which, in combination with massive wildfires, introduces all sorts of added risks. Drought may be playing a role in these fire-generated thunderstorms, pyrocumulonimbus, Pyro CBs for short. These are erratic, dangerous events, and these are, you know, often associated with fires that can burn through the night. Darius, what does this mean for firefighting efforts? Not all fires will result in OB, uh, overnight burning events, just like they don't now. They're still relatively uncommon in the grand scheme of things, considering how many fires we have. But as we heard from Flanagan, at least some level of forecasting is possible. But knowing what will happen is a far cry from preventing it. Uh, as we saw last year, firefighters are already stretched thin. And this isn't just one more added pressure. In many ways, it's a whole different ballgame. Using aircraft, you have to be able to fly at night. You want night vision and, you know, the specialized training and equipment that goes with that. Alberta does have a helicopter with night vision that can be used for nighttime operations. Uh, California does it, um, but most jurisdictions don't. What does that mean for this season? Well, snowpack levels and the uh, upcoming potentially warm and dry season mean that it could be difficult to see uh, really any, any change in what we saw last year in terms of all these overnight burning events. But it shouldn't be a surprise that in a changing climate on a changing planet, our fires are changing too. Uh, as Flanagan told me, we've seen more area burned in the last seven years than the 58 years before that. And as last summer made abundantly clear, a fire that spreads overnight poses a particular danger to British Columbians, their homes, and the people protecting them. So it may not just be the way we think about fires that has to change, but how we fight them as well. Darius Madabi, thanks very much. Here's a live look at White Rock and Canada's longest pier. Darius will have your BC-wide forecast right after this. Drifting over to the nine on the other side for a 25. Chances. Yeah. Oh, and that's gone over to the seven for a 24. Was that an opportunity wasted there from Virginia Chenier? It certainly does look like it, with my maths are right. Christine Essebour has taken this one by six set four. The All-Canadian gold medal match sees Essebour, the former Georgian, take gold in the Continental Olympic qualifier for the Americas. Virginie Chenier, her teammate, with silver. Medalla de Plata. Y representando a Canadá, Virginie Chenier. It was an all-Canadian final. And, and she had a chance to win with a final arrow. She dropped it into the seven. Virginie Chenier from Canada. 29-year-old collecting the silver medal. 
her eyes, along with her teammates, will turn to qualification chances at the Pan American Championships coming right here in Medellin after this competition is concluded. Speaking of teammates, here is one of them, the champion of the continental qualifier for the Paris 2024 Olympic Games, Christine Essebua. Former four-time Olympian for Georgia, has got top spot. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. CBC Vancouver returns as the exclusive media partner of the DOXA Documentary Film Festival, May 2nd to 12th. Enjoy thoughtful and engaging documentaries, special presentations, and industry events. For festival program and tickets, visit doxafestival.ca and never miss a special programming series, event, or contest. Subscribe to CBC Vancouver's e-newsletter and keep connected with us. The weather update is brought to you by Direct Buy Furnace. To cool and clean the air in your home, call Direct Buy Furnace. Installing Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. Our science and climate specialist, Darius Madavi, has our BC wide weather forecast. We do need more precipitation, and we are getting more. How long will it stick around? Oh, not too long, honestly. Uh, probably not as long as you would hope if mm. you were hoping for some precipitation. We've got a good day of rain and then maybe lingering into early Friday morning, but mostly clearing up for a sun and cloud Friday across really the south coast and Vancouver Island. You can see here that we've already had that cloud built in. We've seen that rain continue to come down the island, down the coast. Uh, now that's going to last from, to, uh, from tonight into tomorrow, uh, probably late evening it'll end and start to clear up a little bit, but then the sun properly comes out again on Friday, probably around noon, or we may see a drizzle in the morning. Uh, and then that uh, rain continues to break into parts of the interior. Snow at higher elevations, freezing levels coming down a smidge, but still around 1,000, 1,200 meters to get any snow. So not, look, not expecting too much more on the mountains, but also not, gonna, not likely to see it decimated too much. Uh, now, if we take a look at our uh, temperatures, you can see after today's relatively warm conditions, we're going to see those drop into tomorrow before coming up again as we head into Friday and into the weekend, where we get pretty warm conditions throughout the southern parts of BC. Warm and dry, generally speaking. Friday still a bit cloudy for parts of the interior, but generally speaking, we're going to be seeing uh, a drying trend and a warming trend into the weekend. Our conditions for tomorrow do look like a ton of activity, but again, here, just scattered showers. West Kootenai is probably seeing some showers as well, but East Kootenai is staying dry. And then really throughout the province, this is just a, a chance of showers, chance of flurries, except for here on the coast where it will be some proper rain. And if we zoom in to Vancouver for our five-day forecast, you can see that we do have that rain coming tomorrow, that drop in temperatures. And then coming back up on Friday, we get those mixed skies again, maybe a drizzle in the morning. We do see uh, warmer temperatures inland, which will be the story right through the weekend and into early next week as we see dry conditions, sunny conditions. So overall, it's going to be a, a very spring-like weekend, Dan. <laughs> no kidding. Darius, thanks very much. Thank you. And that's your late news for Wednesday. Thank you for joining us tonight. For news anytime, check our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Your next local news is on the early edition on CBC Radio 1. That starts tomorrow morning at 5.30. Good night.